Geeks, I'm not sure if you've been following what's happening in France, but things there are going a little look crazy. You got the French protesting the president's move to increase the retirement age by two years. The unions are pissed. Now people are protesting scooters on the street while President Macron is kissing President Xi's ass. But the real icing on the cake, the real piece to absurd resistance, is that in the midst of all this weirdness, a French government minister appeared on the cover of Playboy magazine. What? When I heard this news, I literally spit my coffee out. Whether you're clothed or not, this is never an advisable move for a woman in politics. What, like Marie Claire was taken? Horny teenagers are not your audience. This was not a well thought out plan. We got a lot to talk about today. We'll start with some Russia updates, the vice president's trip to Africa, Paul Rusesa Bagina was released from Rwanda, OPEC countries are making gas prices higher, and we're celebrating World Autism Day with former New York representative Yuli Niu. Before we start though, please hit the subscribe button below, click the notification bell, and like this video. Okay, where do we begin? Let's start with Russia detaining American reporter Evan Gershkovich, since the news here has been so consumed with Donald Trump that this guy is not getting the attention he deserves. On March 29th, Gershkovich was detained in Ekaterinburg, Russia, where he works for the Wall Street Journal. He was accused of espionage, which can carry a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. Both the Wall Street Journal and Biden administration deny he's a spy, and everyone has called for his immediate release, including Brittany Griner, all the news outlets, the president, and Secretary Blinken, who called Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov about it. Here's why Russia did this. We live in an era of hostage diplomacy and Americans are valuable targets. After Russia traded Brittany Griner for arms dealer Victor Booth, they probably figured they needed another high profile American in addition to Paul Whelan to use as a bargaining chip. And unfortunately, journalists are a common target. This kind of move reflects a level of desperation. Russia has no other tools. And so they do this to give themselves leverage. And why wouldn't Russia be desperate? Numerous Russians are unhappy with this war and hundreds of thousands have fled the country. A famous Russian military blogger who is very supportive of the war was just killed in a bombing in Russia. By the way, this story is kind of nuts. A woman walked into a cafe where there was some kind of group discussion with him and she participated in the conversation and then told the guy she made a bust of him. So guards told her to leave it at the door because they thought it could be a bomb. And both the woman and the blogger shared a laugh about it. So she gave it to him. And then he set it down on the table and it exploded. Who's laughing now? <gasps> bomb? <laughs> thank you, thank you. To add to Russia's desperation, Finland has officially joined NATO, which is a big deal, because now you have NATO territory running right up against Russia, all 800 miles of it. Finland is a militarily strong country, and so not only do they have a lot to offer the NATO alliance, but now NATO could put more defensive military equipment literally right next to Russia. Putin downplayed the whole thing, of course, but then warned of countermeasures. It's not a big deal, who cares? It is a big deal, and it's good news for NATO and the West. And while this heightened sense of insecurity Putin feels will also further anger him, this development places the West in a stronger position for future possible negotiations. Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to Africa, and this trip is a bigger deal than most realize. So let's get our FOPO on. The VP traveled to Ghana, Tanzania, and Zambia, and her trip actually follows a series of high-level US officials going to the continent. Before her, Secretary Blinken, Treasury Secretary Yellen, the First Lady, and the US Ambassador to the UN all went to Africa. So what's going on? The goal of this trip is to push back on Russia and mostly China. Geek out with me. For the last decade, China has been heavily expanding its presence across Africa through something present she created called the Belt and Road Initiative. The goal of this was to reinvigorate the old silk trading route along the East African coast. And it has turned into an initiative to expand Chinese trade with Africa and also bring Africa into China's sphere of influence. Through this, China has offered loans to build massive infrastructure projects. And if the countries can't pay the hefty loans back, which they often can't, then they sometimes have to give China control over land or pay in natural minerals and resources. Some people say it's a Chinese investment strategy that has had its pitfalls. I would call it a debt trap. Russia has also expanded its influence in Africa by sending its mercenaries with the Wagner Group to certain governments who use them for security and militant purposes. But these mercenaries have committed horrific atrocities and human rights abuses wherever they are. So as you can imagine, these efforts by China and Russia influence the region's politics, which in the future could affect how they work with the United States or how they approach democracy and human rights. Now, I don't wanna say the US has been asleep at the wheel, but let's just say we've been snoozing. US policy in Africa has been less focused on the opportunities and investment there, and more focused on fixing problems like counterterrorism and providing humanitarian aid. But now the US can't afford to do that. 
Never has that been more obvious than after the Ukraine war, where a number of African countries have either expressed support for Russia or abstained from condemning them. And so as things divide even more, the US does not want Africa to fall into President Xi or President Putin's slimy little hands. And that's why senior US officials have been traveling there and announcing new investments or projects. While she was there, the VP announced some great programs in health and for women and working with the youth and efforts to push back on extremism. She also warned governments against working with China, particularly when she was in Zambia, where China's efforts have plunged the country into a horrific amount of debt. Now, given the lofty goal at hand, the trip overall felt a little underwhelming, and that's because the US has a long way to go. I am a deep believer there are enormous benefits to being friends with the United States, and I think African countries know that too. I'm just not so sure they're willing to pick a side between one or the other. Geeks, do you remember the movie Hotel Rwanda? It's an amazing film about a guy named Paul Rosessa Begina who helped save over 1,200 lives by hiding Rwandans in his hotel during the 1994 Rwandan genocide, which resulted in 800,000 deaths in only 100 days. This guy received the US Presidential Medal of Freedom for his bravery. So after being jailed in Rwanda for almost three years, Rosessa Begina was finally freed last week and reunited with his family in San Antonio, Texas. But why was he even arrested in the first place? Rusessa Begina, who's now 68 years old and a Belgian citizen and permanent US resident, left Rwanda after surviving a terrifying assassination attempt in 1996. He's been a vocal dissident of Rwanda's leader, Paul Kagame, who brutally cracks down on political dissidents. In August 2020, Rwandan government agents tricked him into getting on a flight to Rwanda while he thought he was boarding a private flight to Burundi. And they did this in order to detain and falsely accuse him of supporting terrorist groups, with a resulting sentence of 25 years in prison. Legal experts around the world denounced these accusations, declaring his trial unfair and calling out the Rwandan government. Now, the reason this story is so important is because of what led to his release. Since his arrest, his family and several Hollywood stars pushed loudly for his release, including actor Don Cheadle, who played him in Hotel Rwanda, and Scarlett Johansson, Chris Evans, and Mark Ruffalo, among others. At first, the State Department was slow to take on the case, since Rusesa Begina wasn't a US citizen and because of valuable but sensitive relations with Rwanda. Rusesa Begina's family later filed a $400 million lawsuit against Kagame. At the Biden administration's recent US-Africa summit in December, in response to pressure to release Rusesa Begina, President Kagame even provocatively said, maybe make an invasion and overrun the country. You can do that. Thankfully, the pressure to get him released grew, most critically from US senators across both parties, who held back $90 million in aid to Rwanda, which helped the US government negotiate his release. When he finally landed in the US and was reunited with his family, his 31-year-old daughter, who has been bravely championing his cause and fighting tirelessly for his release, said all of us crumbled when we saw him. This story highlights how political prisoners can get released when people publicly campaign for it and when governments use the tools at their disposal. <laughs> At Saudi Arabia's leadership, OPEC surprised everyone by further cutting oil production, which immediately caused an increase in gas prices. Saudi Arabia says the reason for this cut was aimed at supporting market stability, which is code word for We want to keep the price of oil high. There are a few things at play here. First, OPEC countries are watching the banking crisis unfold here in the United States, and a global recession could lead to lower oil prices. In fact, prices dipped towards $70 a barrel in mid-March, whereas it was as high as $139 a barrel in March of last year. So they wanted to get out ahead of that and ensure prices go back up. Second, the move looks ugly because a large reason for the increase in prices is because of the Ukraine war and Russia sanctions. And so basically OPEC is saying, well, we don't care, making it look like they side with Russia. Which leads me to my third point, which is that there is likely an effort to deliberately stick it to the United States and to President Biden in particular. Aha, uh -huh, maybe. Biden has made reducing gas prices and inflation a key goal of his administration. And so this move is gonna hinder those efforts, which matters a lot, especially as he gears up for the next election. Doesn't look like that fist bump was very successful, Joe. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this decision happened only a couple weeks after China brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's all part of a general trend where Saudi Arabia is turning away from the United States. I'm hoping these guys just shoot themselves in the foot with this plan, since they'll also end up suffering from global inflation, and since this move will only push the rest of the world to further invest in alternative energy. Congress is actually considering passing legislation called NOPEC. Ha, that's catchy. Which would allow the US to seize OPEC assets within US jurisdiction if it's found they're involved in market collusion would be a big move if it happens. This move isn't just about manipulating market prices, but it's also about interfering in our election. And for that reason, OPEC and its lovely leader, Saudi Arabia, are on my list this week.
I am excited to feature an inspiring political leader who is courageously breaking barriers here in the US. April 2nd was World Autism Day, and I got to speak with Yulin Yu, who's one of the first public officials with autism in the United States. She was actually born in Taiwan and came to the US with her parents when she was a baby. Yulin was diagnosed with autism when she was 22, but she first noticed symptoms in grade school when her teacher said that she read too much. She served as a member of the New York State Assembly, and while she was in public service, she's spoken about how disabled and neurodiverse communities have been left out of policymaking for a long time. And she says autism is actually her superpower. She says it helps her understand other people's perspectives differently in ways that a non-autistic person might miss. So I wanted to bring her on to understand why it's so important to have more people like her in office. Hey, Yulene, thank you so much for joining me on Oh My World. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have somebody like you because you are so inspiring. Why is it so important to have people who are disabled and from neurodiverse communities in government? You have argued this before. Can you share it with us? I mean, I think that it's really about perspective and lenses, right? I think that for... Um you know, a lot of different reasons. We want different, uh, you know, people with different worldviews, perspectives um, in different positions so that we can include um, everyone. You know, I think that when we're talking about neurodiversity, when we're talking about, you know, folks who are disabled, I think that, you know, having um, a lens that everybody if you're even if you're lucky enough right now to be able bodied, even if you're lucky enough to, um, you know, be able-minded like you know every single person um will be disabled one day if you're old enough right and I think that people don't realize that when you know you're making policy and when you're making laws and rules for um others like thinking about accessibility and thinking about the needs of everyone really um you know, means that you have to kind of see from that lens. Thank you, Yulene, for joining Oh My World. And thank you for being a voice for this community and for fighting for a better world. Thank you so much for hosting. <laughs> Thanks, geeks. I have some exciting news. Oh My World has been nominated for a Webby Award. Do you know what this means? This is a big FOBO deal. You know what, I'm just gonna read part of the letter because it's so cool. As a Webby nominee, your work has been singled out as one of the five best in the world in its category, meaning it's among the top 12% of the nearly 14,000 projects entered. And we're next to nominees like PBS NewsHour, ABC News, CBS 60 Minutes, Geeks, they have huge teams and we're like the little engine that could. So one of the awards we're up for is the Webby People's Voice Award, which means we need the geeky voices to vote. So now instead of asking you to like this video, click the subscribe button, I mean, you should do that too. I'm asking you to please vote at the link in this video description by April 20th. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and stay fabulous, geeks.